Yep. Hello, everybody. This is the Art Life Video <laughs> Blog, day 42. Two. Day 42, we're here. My name is Jacob Wolf. Christopher Hoisington, and we're here with Dave Camp in his apartment uh, in, uh, what is this, southeast yep. Portland? Yep. yep, southeast. And uh, it's a really nice view here. It's a beautiful day. I'm going to close this yeah, window because it's, it's a little loud. Window, yeah. Yeah. So Dave is a he, he's a musician by trade, but he started working on a graphic novel about two years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, why don't you tell us about that a little bit? Um, the graphic novel came out of I was starting to work on a second record for my band Stereo Vision, and I thought rather than just write a bunch of uh, songs with random pronouns, she said, and he said, and whatever. I thought, well, let's put a little bit of a skeleton in this, uh, some kind of a story. And so I thought about who the characters were on the first record, and I kind of started sketching a little bit on this and that. And as I went through it, I started to see more of a story. And I thought, well, I don't want to do it as a rock opera or something where I have yeah, to be yeah, a character yeah. or whatever. So, but I kept sketching on it because it was compelling to me. And after a while, I thought, you know, this is actually a story. This is this really does have an, an arc and has some sort of um, narrative value to it. So I kind of tricked myself into writing it. Does does your story have uh, like a soundtrack? Well, the yeah, in a in a sense, in a sense, I didn't write a score for it, sort of scene to scene. But I thought trying to keep it simple in all of these areas, that the stereo vision stuff, the music stereo vision would, would go well with it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I didn't want to get too rigid with it. Um, Were there songs that came out of this with stereo vision? Well, yeah, kind of actually, when, now that you mentioned it. What was, um, mm -hmm. yeah, there's, a, there's a, a bunch of things that will be on this new record that have little bits and pieces of it. And the, the character itself is very much still the guy that came out of that first record. But um, I made him a little more narrative than with, with the graphic novel. I wish it was real concise, but it's, it's basically a guy who's a, it's kind of a hedge fund manager kind of guy. He was raised in boarding schools by wealthy people to be focused on what he's doing. Money. It's money, exactly. And it's a very predatory, not feeling, rise to the top, you know, dog eat dog sort of uh, character uh, narrative in, in terms of his family life. And his soul gets sucked out of his body in a yes. fluke, you know, a Loki the god of chaos drives a spirit highway through the financial district and Niall's <laughs> soul is whipped from his body and normally he would have just died, which is what they think is happening to people. But... Um, another enterprising young soul sees him and says, I'm going to hop into this body and get incarnated right now. So suddenly this very uptight, very by the book guy has this kind of wild soul inside of him. And of course he doesn't know what's happened to him, but yeah, hilarity ensues. He basically goes through everybody. His old society rejects him and he ends up living downtown in this quarantined area with all these hipsters. Who think the world's gonna end, and so that's sort of what sets the story. Does he? That's take... a really interesting premise if you think about what he just said, because what he said was his soul was taken out of him, and another soul was put in, and he was aware that something had changed, but he wasn't sure what that was. Right. There was a soul switch, and yet he remained the same. That's really interesting. Yeah, I'm, I, that's and those were the kind of things that I thought about. I thought. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. What would that be like to be the one? I've always tried to. Person? I've always wondered. You know, what do they mean by the soul? Because mm -hmm. I understand the intellect. I mm -hmm. understand the mind. I understand the emotions. You know, those all fit. Is he? But what the fuck is a soul? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> is your character supposed to be the protagonist or the antagonist of the story, or does he kind of play both roles? He he is. It's like Bill Murray and Groundhog's Day kind of thing. He is. He is the protagonist. Absolutely, we are watching this guy on his journey. Whether he's a good guy or a bad guy, he starts off as a bad guy. He is—he's an asshole, just classic, straight cut right out of the thing. But 
that gave him somewhere at least to go. Mm -hmm. I thought if I started it in the middle, it would be very boring. So I <laughs> figured I'd start all the way over here and then see where I could take this guy, how far he could move, given as when you talk about the soul in Buddhism and stuff, they think of um, the soul kind of part of a being is something that carries all of these encoded desires through lifetimes. And so I use that as a little bit of a template. Okay. It's all this this stuff that they want to work through or do in that lifetime. And Niall, his soul, because I did backstory stuff on it, um, he was a soul that had done very well, you know, it had risen up into being a person in power in other points in history, and then had screwed up so bad that he'd gone through incarnation after incarnation as trying, you know, to, trying to fix his karma. Yeah, exactly. And try to figure out, okay, we're going to start you at the beginning again and see if we can get you to be a civilized human you know, being. <laughs> yeah, human being, some sort of some sort of actual contributor to the world. And so once that soul's removed and he gets his wild soul, you know, anything's possible. He's got a lot of power. Huh. Is it a, is it a story that you kind of pre-wrote or are you discovering the story as as it goes along? I wrote it and that came from uh, I made a documentary called The Wanted's it's on my website, and what's your website? It's it's called uh, decamparts.com. Decamparts.com. Yep. And what we found with the Wanted's was, and what I found also doing music stuff and record stuff was, when you have a few good ideas and then you kind of chase them around, it's easy to get lost. Um, it is a lot easier to start with, and this is what I was just saying to a friend of mine the other day. Start with the world's simplest story or the world's simplest structure and then make it complicated as you go along. Because what we did with the Wanted's was we would cut scenes and the scenes would be beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then we'd put them up against a bunch of other scenes and it was a crappy movie. Right. It just didn't move very well. It jumped all over the place. It Emotionally, did. probably. And just in, a, and in every other way. And okay. so what we really had to do in the end was say, let's think of this as one whole thing. So with Stereo Vision, with this comic book, I was like, you write this whole thing. Especially since I didn't really know how to draw. I knew it was gonna be a nightmare. I knew it was gonna be insane. So I figured just limit the variables as much as yeah. humanly possible. So uh, did you, I used to write screenplays mm -hmm. and there's a definite uh, structure to a screenplay. You get to the, you got a half an hour and you get to the first plot point. You got an hour, you get to the second plot point and then your conclusion is in a half an hour. Is that the same kind of way you approach that? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I tried to do it as traditionally as I could. I didn't do it. I didn't do it by the book. Right. Like I didn't have the structure out in front of me, but I, I definitely wanted to make this as easy on myself and on the viewers as yeah. possible. I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. I just wanted to start off. You introduce the guy. You get him up a tree, and then you see with this weird character in this weird circumstance mm -hmm. how they inter interface. Whether they're going to go up or down, it's like a football game. You want to. Have them be up a couple points, down a couple points. Did the did the story or the characters surprise you at all? Um, yeah, it all all of the when I was first laying it out, it was all really kind of surprising. Actually, yeah. I thought I'll be you know I'll be doggone. <laughs> I, I bet that it was surprising, especially because you said you said you're not like really an artist. Mm -hmm. To see the work that you're able to do, like that you're able to to create. You had no idea. How long have you been drawing? Well, I always drew a little bit just as a sort of like a kid, you know, and, yeah. and I kind of wanted to learn to draw, but I really wanted to play music. So I worked on that. And then this, I did this about two years ago. I wrote it probably three years ago. Okay. I wrote it in my head and sketched and just sort of thought it through. And then I sat down in the summer and wrote it over the course of six weeks, the actual whole book. This is just part one of it. And, wow. and then um, I said, okay, I'm going to learn to draw just good enough to do a mock-up, sort of a, what do they call it, you know? Just, uh, what do they call it, storyboards? Yeah, storyboard. Just so I can storyboard this out and get this to a real artist and I'm just going to give it away. Right. So I started getting into all these art books that I'd always had and working on a little bit of anatomy. And okay, today I'm doing hands and I'll do see how long is the arm in relation to the right, right, right. skeleton and stuff. All this academic, very boring, not very much fun stuff. And then I just started research. drawing. What's that? Research. 
Basically, yeah, and practice. <laughs> trying to, yeah, trying to train myself, and I, I just basically, like I said, fooled myself into doing it. And then I started trying, like, how do you draw three people? I can draw one person, but then three of us in relation, our skulls the right size. Yeah, we're yeah, sitting yeah. on the surface. It was well, totally the other, bizarre. The other thing about drawing for a comic book is that you have to draw the same character yes. over and over again, and he always has to look the same. Yep. And the other thing is you have to change the perspective all yeah. the time. So yeah. you got to have that character look like that character if he's far away or if he's close up. It's yep. a really difficult process. And even yeah, and even weirder than that, once I did the first basic iteration of the whole thing, a lot of the stuff was shot just like this. Like, okay, this is just your steady, medium shot. And I thought, this is not going to work. Mm -hmm. And in comic books, man, you want to have dramatic yeah. angles yeah. going up right. and down and off to the side. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how to draw perspective. So then you're even into that. Like, is his nose really bulbous or is he <laughs> pointed? Right, I, you right. know. So yeah, it was, as a as an artist, it was a massive learning process. Everything was a surprise. But you know, I mean, you're, yeah. you're, really, you're really good. Well, Where's I the, appreciate that. Did you have that? Yeah. Well, yeah, I've got. I mean, I have this little this guy. Is, these these are not these are not stills from the from the graphic novel. We can show you those in a little bit. But these, is, go ahead. Is, yeah, this is Breakfast with the Stars, where if I'm eating a meal by myself, I'll have have it with somebody cool instead of just sitting there. So that's Joey Ramone and Elliot Smith joining me for breakfast. I might have something else too. Oh yeah, yeah, I do. I, gotta show you guys. I mean, it, he's he's got a real talent. For the art, and I, I love the, I love the. It's Nikki Six and um, Mahatma Gandhi. That was a good I one. I love how, how. Uh, I just love the way you make the marks on the page. You know, I mean, they're they're kind of scribbly and, right. and uh, Kurt Cobain. sketchy, but you can tell who it is. Yeah, you can tell what's going on. Yeah, because you get a great style. Now, do you do you start with a pencil or you use straight pen? The way that I do the. Um, these guys, and then my little, I, I got another guy called um, Johnny Tailpipe. That's a little one panel com comic thing I do. And on those guys, I really just, I try to, I use a real thin ink pen. But as I said, I labor, like stuff like the graphic novel or records, or I do music for films or TV commercials. We labor over those. Yeah. They have to be perfect. Yeah. And if I'm gonna put out a book or a record, Man, I'll fix that thing and I'll recut the drums seven times. I'll keep playing the guitar, keep singing the vocal until I really feel like it's there. So doing this stuff, I just do it. Yeah. I do that in the from the beginning of breakfast or lunch or dinner or whatever to the end of it. I do one thing. If it looks stupid, that's the way the ball bounced. And you do that every day? Mm, I do it whenever. Yeah. But I, but often. Yeah. Yeah, I've been told that that's the best practice. If somebody wants to learn how to draw or paint, they do a little, do a little bit every day. Mm -hmm. You know. For sure. I I haven't been able to do that. I'm not that disciplined. But I am, I, I, I must be disciplined. I don't know what the thing is. <laughs> Driven. It I shows. Sure. It really does. I but on it. the uh, I appreciate it. Thank on you. the graphic novel, he's got the graphic novel on his computer, and I'm assuming. Are you drawing it on that pad there? I am. I am. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then you. Fix it through Photoshop or something? What I do is, um, I had, there's a program, I didn't know anything about any of this, and I thought I would draw it on paper. Okay. Um, and then I scanned in the first 28 or 30 pages, and I thought, forget this, man, there's too much distance between here and there, and then I gotta fix it in there anyway, and I'm not, I'm not awesome enough to be like, it's done, that's it. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's a, pr a program that's like manga. I don't. I can't remember what it is. Sorry, whoever it's makes that. It's a software. It's a software. It's software. Program. Yeah, and um, and so they have pens and brushes and stuff like that. And I figured out what size to use and how. It was. It was weird. It was disorienting, actually. Yeah, I bet. Because you can you can zoom in as close as you want, or you can go out as far as you want. So. What does it really look like? Well, and and you're not. It's not direct. Mm -mm. Like like when you put a pen on a paper, you're directly seeing the mark right on the paper underneath the pen. But with your computer, mm -hmm. you're making a mark over here that's coming out over here. It's really weird. You mm -hmm. do learn how to do it. I can look look at the screen and draw, and that's incredible. <laughs> it's really strange, <laughs> but it does. You you eventually your brain just wires up to know that that's how. How it long works. did it take you to learn how to use the program? The, the program wasn't that bad. Okay. They, they set it up pretty good. I know Photoshop pretty good and from 
cutting the movie and stuff, uh, Final Cut and those kind of things, okay. and Pro Tools, I unfortunately had to learn all kinds of stuff to have a little business, you know, just to be able to do all those, you know, get your design stuff up to tell them where you are that day or post mm -hmm. a movie or whatever. Anyway, so um, it took a little while. The program wasn't that hard. Getting used to the weird writing tablet kind of thing, that took a little bit, but I don't remember. It's like, how long did it take to get calces to play your guitar? It's like, I don't remember. Because <laughs> it was so hard after that. Like, just getting the calluses was, was not the thing that I remember the most. But, uh, yeah, just having to figure out that the inside of the eyes hits at the side of the nostrils and how does that look from the side. That's the kind of stuff that is still... And bringing emotion to it and energy. Yeah, that's, that's really hard, too, is, is especially with a graphic novel. Like, in a movie... You have the actor to embody the emotion, and that is automatically contagious. You know, mm -hmm. when, right. I, when you're watching a movie, <laughs> for and you see somebody yeah. get emotional, you're in there with them. Mm -hmm. But with right. a graphic novel, you're not, you're not as connected to the characters. Mm -hmm. You know, so the drawings are what really has to bring out who that person is. I mean, it's true. The dialogue is, and the narrative. I mean, they always have narrative, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, one of the things that I fell in love with in Spider-Man was the, the drawings. Yes. Uh, and he was, he, he'd stumble around and he'd, he was suffering, you know, mm -hmm. because he was trying to get through school and please his boss. And, and he was going through all this emotional stuff and you got to see that in the in the story I didn't see that in any of the other comic books that I was reading you know uh, like Batman was always yeah, right. the millionaire and the Superman was always king you know uh, he, he right. never had any problem right Spider-Man was the first one that I came across that had issues and they came up they came out in in the drawings as much as the story yeah right well this you know, you'll like this then this guy struggles non-stop okay. <laughs> he's just like this little like human puppet just sort of getting punched all the way through which is funny because he starts off as a guy who thinks of himself as Superman and then realizes he is most unquestionably not Superman and there's a lot of that and I, I love that I think it's it's fun to see somebody be human and to be raw like that I, I totally hear it you. sounds like a, uh, a real uh, how do I say it? Um, I mean, I want to say it, it sounds like a soul searching mm -hmm. kind of. That's what it is. Uh, I mean, you switch souls, and mm -hmm. and uh, is there an introspective quality to it? Yep, yep. There, there most certainly is. It, it's. I wanted to make it fun, mm -hmm. and so the fact that he lives with these bohemian party people allows for a, a, some of the fun, sex, drugs, and rock and roll parts of the stuff. So it's not totally dreary. But yeah, this is a guy who loses his identity and everything he's ever known in the world. And he has to figure out how to be a human being, how to relate to the world, how to be, how to be humble in a sense that he's not the king of everything, and figure out a new way of economy, a new way of community. So in a lot of ways, it really is a story. And this was, as you guys both hit on, was I surprised by anything? I didn't have any idea about this is what kind of a story I was writing. I was just... I don't know what I thought, I just started making the characters up and what emerged from it was really, it's a story about going from the 20th century into the 21st century. Mm -hmm. The end of the American, you know, we got it, don't worry about it, every generation after us is going to make more, do more, be better, and coming to a place where that American man and that predatory idea of business is just not going to really make it anymore. No, it's not. It's going to be a very, it's going to be a different thing. It only it'll be like either a ruling class and a lot of regular working people, or we don't know what it's going to be. It's going to yeah. be something, but this guy doesn't know what it is either. And that's right. that's ideally that's why I decided to write this. I knew that this was a story about something. It wasn't just the guy, you know, the cachet of heroin in the trunk that he's got to get to the border before the FBI gets there. Right. You know. So this is the first part of your book. Yeah, that's right. Um. How many pages is this first graphic novel? The first one pages will be like about a hundred, right in that. Um, and uh, again, this is all just. And how many parts are you expecting? It'll be three parts. Three parts. So, in keeping with, it's a three-act. 
ideally. Mm -hmm. This is sort of the introduction. Mm -hmm. We get him into the situation. We introduce the characters. Mm -hmm. I could have all done it in whack. You just make an art. You know it's going to take forever. You know it's possible that people are just going to look at it and be like, eh, I didn't really like it. You know. <laughs> I don't know. I kind of, you know. <laughs> As long as they buy it before well, you, they toss it. I know. I mean, I mean, you hope. You hope. They might just stand in the comic book store and be like, "Yep, totally stupid. Don't care." Mm -hmm. So, doing doing a three part thing seemed. I knew it was going to be excessive and ridiculous, but I also knew I like doing things in series because it allows me to improve as I go. So maybe the third book's going to look better than the first one. I'm hope. sure it will. Okay. Well, I yeah. Think, really, I think Peter Jackson is. <laughs> is a good uh, mm -hmm. example of that. Well, yeah. we just got the the anthology of uh, Jack Kent's. He had the three books that he oh, yeah. put Oh yeah, he put one. it all into one book and you could totally see like in the beginning. It's incredible. It's really kind of simple. It's very good. And what but is, the, is the drawings are simple. It's a comic. Uh, he, it's, he, he's a comic book oh, yeah. artist. Uh, he does goals. Okay, gotcha. Old comics. And it's like the Sunday comics kind of, or cool. the daily comics. You get a little three panel, mm -hmm. and he sends them through that. Facebook. Oh, okay. And uh, you get a little three panel, but but and now he's doing book. completely color. But the, the he did all of his black and whites into one anthology, and it was three books that he put into one. And the the progression through it is amazing. You can see it evolve. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, all you have to do. I, I guarantee you that we'll see the same. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't yeah. think anybody. I mean, I'm sure it's the same with music. Mm -hmm. You started out and oh, it was yeah. kind of rough and difficult. You had to watch your fingers, and then yeah. later on, it's like, oh yeah, hey, look at that girl over there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, hey, wait, oh, okay, hold on. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sucking again. Sucking again. Okay, fix, fix. Yeah, no, that's true, and I enjoy seeing that as well, looking at comic book books or anybody, authors. Someone was just saying it on Facebook today, they wanted to redraw their first part of their graphic novel. There's something awesome about early work. Mm -hmm. It's it's personal, mm -hmm. and, you, and just like you're talking about Spider-Man being somebody that actually had burdens in his day-to-day -day life, I love... Like, I love the Velvet Underground or Elliot Smith more than, say, some slick pop thing that somebody put out Boston. last week. What's that? Boston. <laughs> it took him 10 years to make an album because the lead singer, <laughs> it wasn't perfect enough for him. That like, was he, was, yeah. he, was, he was spending all this time trying to make it perfect instead of just putting it out, you know? Well, yes. Uh, yeah, and you... So you get these really imperfect pieces of art, and they're just awesome. That can be your favorite. Like band. those are, those are the ones that collectors want. Right. Are the stuff before you got famous. Right. So fucking keep keep your shit. Yeah. <laughs> so hey, yeah. for me, <laughs> the process began as an artist. Of, I don't know how I got this philosophy, but somewhere in my twenties. I got this idea, and it came from a lot of different places. That 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 whatever happens in the moment is the most valuable thing on the planet, mm -hmm. because this is all we have. And so, as an artist, when I when I started creating, I never ever. I mean, a graphic novel is something I would never imagine to do, just because it takes yeah. so much time and so much energy. And it's got to be planned out. It's got to be figured out, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. And for me, as an artist, I want to discover. I mm. want to discover what's inside of me. And the plan, the, the, the intention kind of, it, it competes with this spontaneity. Absolutely. I mean, you've got the, you've got the two things and, and you, you have to marry them. You can't do it. You have to have both. Yep. But... My my intention, my goal is to discover what's inside of me rather than try to make myself create something that I've already decided is going to be. I don't know how to... I know what you're saying. I, and it's... Um, I think what happens with me, and that's why I think all artists, you wind up being a little bit of an oddity, even if you were probably a little oh, yeah. bit of an oddity to start with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then as you go on, it, it can expand. Yeah. And I think that one of the things for me is that moment is very long. Yeah. It's I like playing in bands where I get a chance to solo or do something spontaneous in the moment and really feel it and be it. But there's something about, for whatever, this is my superpower and it's a weird thing, with that moment, 
extends for months or years for me. Mm -hmm. As long as I can stay focused on it and keep doing it, there is a living, spontaneous aspect to it, even though it's in a very disciplined form. Yeah. I see I see what you're talking about in what we're doing with the Art Life video. Right, blog. exactly, yes. Like it is it is planned, but our interview with you is as spontaneous as two days. Yes. <laughs> yes. This is, this this is, is what I'm coming. And this yes. is what I learned when I was studying acting is you have a script. Right. You have a, a, usually you have a director who's got an idea of how he wants things or she wants things. And then as an actor, you're, you you have to you have to know your lines. You have to know what you're doing in the scene. Mm -hmm. You have to know what the director wants from you in the scene. Mm -hmm. And then you have creative freedom. You yes. have to be in the moment. You have to, inhabit you have it. to yes. live it. And and and, it, and again, the two have to exist side by side. Yeah. Like and, and the training as an actor becomes like knowing what you have to do and yet still being free within that framework of yes. having to fit that. Yes. And I think that's sort of what drives my art is like I, I, I want it to be heavy on the spontaneous rather than the planning, but it, it's just... But that's a preference. I mean, it's a preference where it's a, an individual inclination. Exactly. The Grateful Dead didn't like making records after a point. They said, our thing is live. That's it. We do it. It disappears. The records are kind of like okay <laughs> to us, right. but that's not our thing. And, you know, somebody like Jackson Pollock obviously is going to be more spontaneous than somebody who is into a very strict... Photo realistic. Yeah, right. exactly. And so I, I, I try to find a space. And when you say about my breakfast with the stars kind of things, they are scratchy. They're supposed to be flawed. The comic book is supposed to be scratchy and flawed. I don't want it to be perfect. I want it to have that sense of immediacy. But I also know I don't want to put something out that people are like, that's eh, crap. I don't, I don't get right. it or whatever. So you it, don't want somebody to look at it and say that you're an amateur. Exactly. It's. And so it, it just ends up being this sort of funny way of getting to the same place, mm -hmm. ideally. But it's like, I wanted to add, just if you're doing theater every night or you're playing the same show every night, you have to come in and find something new in that character mm -hmm. and new in that moment and new in that scenario to some days you're going to feel like crap and that's going to make the character different. So there is something, it's just a matter of your own temperament and I have this one, it's a very odd one. <laughs> <laughs> So can we check out some of your work? Yeah, on the for sure. Computer? For sure. All right. I'm going to be behind the camera for now. Okay. So I can just give you, I, I don't know if you can see it. Is, is there enough uh, to reflective and stuff? Uh, it's on there. Okay. So that's, that's my buddy Jenny Dagger. And Jenny Dagger, she rescues Niall, who's running naked away, saying there's a freaking parade. Niall was a very uptight hedge fund guy who loses everything. And his, uh, well, I've already told you that stuff. His soul gets sucked out of his body, but he's kind of rescued over time by Jenny Dagger and that's um, Stargirl. I didn't want to make a big deal about the names. I just thought once you start getting into the characterizations, people just accept them. <laughs> but um, she rescues Niall and they live down in this quarantined area with all these hipster partiers. And Niall looks out his window and he can see this massive parade out in the streets in this quarantine zone. And no one else can see it. So that sort of takes us forward as we go through because he, it turns out, has stereo vision. Huh. He, he can see things other people can't see. Stereo vision? Yeah, stereo vision. So he's seeing, he's seeing two different tracks through each eye? He's seeing, well, no, that's, I think that's what stereo vision really means. He's seeing two different realities. He sees both the terrestrial world that we see and he can also see into this spirit realm. Okay. It's just across, you know, one frequency over from this. So once, once he has stereo vision, he knows little bits and pieces of the of the big story that other people do not know. Stereo vision. Okay. I wish I had. Is that, that something that you uh, yeah. you created for the story, or is that something that you, like a power that you feel you have? Do you see? No. <laughs> um, no. Yeah. Because then the next the next people to be coming to my house would be the men with the nets yes. and you know, the white coats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, it, Stereo Vision was the name of my band, uh -huh. and I came up with it. I was sitting in the back of my car in Dallas. I was selling T-shirts, 
um, when I lived in Texas for a while, and I was laying in the back of my van because I was sleeping in the van in the parking lot of this uh, place where I was selling stuff, and it just popped into my head, and I thought, that's a good idea. So I wrote it down, and a few years later, when I had a chance to do the band, we named it Stereo Vision. And then when I started working on this, that popped into my head. I thought, this guy has Stereo Vision. And once I knew the name, and I knew what it was, and the band name and everything, I thought, I have to write this. I can't help but feel like there's something subconscious coming through you right now. Something that's going on behind the scenes inside of you that's actually being... Projected into this? Yeah, or sure. being explored through it, right? Absolutely, no question. I mean, that's... No question. Yeah, artists do that on a daily basis, I it's feel. awesome. I think it's the only way you can do it. I, if I didn't care about this guy or care about telling his story and seeing him, he is a part of me for sure. I just, I made him into a cartoon version. Right. Um, and of course there's all the, all the things that you can't be or do in the real world, but just like Spider-Man, yeah. you're exploring a side of your vulnerability, the loss of that sense of, um, of uh, invulnerability or uh, superiority mm -hmm. that you have when you're a kid, like you're going to take on the world. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, no, but it, ideally, I hope, I see myself in it, and I, as with art, you hope that other people see themselves in it. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily agree that all artists do that. You know, I think yeah. some artists discover, you know, the thing that, like, there's people that they, they work with wood, and that's what they work with, mm -hmm. and that's, and there's no real introspection in it. They mm -hmm. just discover what they like to create, and they create beautiful things, and they sell it, but it's. They're still not looking inside themselves yeah. for anything, or they're not discovering anything new about themselves through their artwork. They're just creating beautiful objects. That's a good point. And they think that's there's two different ways of looking at art. I tend to be more introspective and mm -hmm. thoughtful in my artwork. You know? Well, I don't understand how an artist can't be introspective because, like we we've talked about this a number of times. As an artist, there's a lot of time that you spend by yourself. Absolutely. In, in a, a box or a room shut off from the world. Yeah. And if, if you're not introspective, then you're, you're just shutting your brain off. Right. And that's... Well, some people, some people, that's what they do. I mean, literally, there's a lot of people walking around on the planet doing things that they don't really know why they're doing them or, or what it's about. They just do them and they know that that supports them. Well, and that's what this guy is. That's, who, that's the, the archetype. In the beginning, he's a guy who has never, and I say it in the first three pages, he never thought about anything. Mm -hmm. He just did the things he was supposed to do, and then suddenly, he is introspective, and it blows his mind. Right. It tears him up because he has no idea about it, what to do with all of this, these thoughts and feelings. Yeah. And that is really what the story is about. But you look at, um, I think of Johnny Ramone from the Ramones. Yeah. And he's an interesting, those guys are interesting because I think that's sort of an artist that didn't want to be introspective and what came out was this sort of blanket like this furious it was all it was like a byproduct byproduct product in a lot of ways of not being introspective so in it i mean we're talking around it but it's like even by not being introspective in a way maybe you're a woodworker but you take out your frustrations about life by chipping away at this stuff maybe yeah. the wood it start, itself starts to look aggressive yeah. Or maybe it starts to look sad or beautiful. It, 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 artists, we sort of leak out into our work. Yeah, maybe they, maybe we don't need to be aware of our introspection mm -hmm. is what you're saying. I yeah. mean, it kind of happens naturally and either, you know, like me, I, I'm, I think, way too fucking much. Mm -hmm. It drives me crazy. My brain's going all <laughs> the time on shit. And even, you know, I can't even get on Facebook and see these... You know, there's, I, I, I hate to be this way, but there's ladies on, on Facebook that, that they spend a lot of time there and they go and they'll, they'll, they'll share these cute little anecdotes, you know, and I, I can never look at those things and not have an opinion, right? Right. right. And I, I have to resist the temptation to make some nasty statement against, you know, something simple like fake it till you make it. Right? Yeah, right. That's, I hate that. Yeah. I hate that. Don't fake nothing. If you're not making it, keep trying, but don't fake anything, you know, that kind of stuff. I have real strong opinions about, <laughs> right? right? But uh, 
I think that there are. I think you're right. You know, I think that there are people that don't necessarily look at themselves, and 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 I call it like a study in your belly button. You know, like mm -hmm. I, I I do that a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I look at my own tummy as if it were the whole world. Sometimes, you know, because yeah. I'm so introspective. But I think that's what I think that's what art provides because I have a super active brain and the other people I know that make art their brains are hyperactive and you got to find a place for that it's why people say that art saves my life or without yeah. music or without drawing or whatever I, you know I, I completely relate to what you're saying and we're and then you create this this weird pearl that some people either like or don't like or right. use or don't use but um when did you start playing music? Uh, when I was a kid, I always, once I knew who Elvis was, when I was six or seven, I was like, that's what I want to be. I want to be Elvis. <laughs> you began to learn nothing. the guitar then? Yeah, I get more or less. Eight, nine. I think I started taking real lessons when I was like 11 or something thereabouts. It came, did it come pretty easy to you? Um, yeah, it okay. did in retrospect. I under, music made total sense to me even as a kid. It turns out my, my great-grandfather was a trumpet player here in Portland in the 30s and 40s, which I didn't know until about four or five years ago, but I thought, I don't know where this comes from, but there was some music that must have just sort of hmm. stayed in that part of the brain yeah. and got to me, and so when I did it, it was I, I was good at it, and I liked doing it, and... It's you a, understood it. There's I understood a, there's it. A, yeah, there's a thing about music. It's a language, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, I never... I, I can sing and I have I can hold a tune in my head like a lot of people can't even oh yeah vocally follow the tune yep yep um, I had a girlfriend that was in voice lessons for a long time but she she just howl right <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't yeah. she couldn't hit the notes yeah. she just couldn't hear it in her ears so I have that but I can't keep rhythm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, I, I've tried to play with a guitar and my fingers don't you know piano. Mm -hmm. My dexterity, my fingers don't respond as quickly as I need them to in mm -hmm. order to play music. You've got to be able to go boom, 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 and yep, I'm like, yep. boom. Well, that's how you start, for sure. And I, then those neural connections get made. See, I never got past it. You know, right. that was the thing, is the, the struggle of trying to make the music, the, you know what I mean? It oh, was yeah, like, I do. For somebody like you, who where it comes easily and naturally, you know, uh, it's not me. I mean, I'm, and I'm, I got a ukulele right now I'm goofing around with, you know. Yeah. It's just not a natural form for me. It's I amazing. Think, but the way I think about these things is, is this, what, we, what we call talent is, uh, in a lot of ways, I don't want it to sound too esoteric, it's not, it's ancestral, but what I mean is that some people's brains are just more adept at exactly some things when mm -hmm. they're born and so a guy who's he could just naturally draw for some reason that part of their brain was all wired in and they could just do it yeah but for somebody like me thankfully something like drawing I never thought I was gonna be good at but I got better at it right. but I did a lot of it those two years I worked almost full-time just drawing all day every day and I didn't see any real progress for about six months so I can understand how someone else who only drew for an hour a day would think I could never be good at this in other words if you can develop those parts of your brain, your fingers are going to start to move faster. Mm. And yes, I agree that for some people the journey is so far. <laughs> that seriously, man, just don't. You can leave the same to somebody else, <laughs> uh, yeah. or leave the math. In my case, I, I I try to do math kind of things. Not not like I spend any time at it, but I'm I'm awful. I look yeah, at yeah. when I look at numbers, they disappear immediately. I am, I mix them up, and it's sad and weird. Yeah. I give people the wrong dates for gigs. Yeah. I, you know, numbers to me are mysterious, but that's just because that part of my brain just, uh, whatever, I just didn't get it. Yeah. Fortunately, it's the part that nobody cares about. You know, at least I don't care. I heard recently somebody say, uh, people that try to play music but can't oftentimes turn to composing because they, they still... Interesting. Uh, I don't know. Their, their fingers can't work that way, but they still have. They can still hear it. They can still hear it. Yeah. And they, so, I mean, do you have any thoughts about that? I, the way I think about all this stuff is there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. Um, it, it, you just. It's that. It's the force of wanting to make the art 
or wanting to make something or to clear out your brain. There's a lot of guys that, you know, Callahan, the cartoonist that was here in Portland. Mm -hmm. you I know, know that guy. Yeah, yeah. And I, he used to come to some gigs that we he did. He was in a wheelchair. He was partially... He, yeah, he yeah. was... He was paraplegic at least. He might have been quadriplegic. Yeah, I, I think he, he, I think he did mind. have a limited, limited function or something. His, his comics were really simple and scratchy, scratchy and. But the but the impulse to create was forced out through this very small yeah. opening. Yeah. But that didn't. He wasn't like ah, I can't do it. Right. So yeah, if you wanna, if you hear music, but can't necessarily play, or you don't have the time, or the inclination, or the gear. I mean, you look at hip hop. And you have a, a population that doesn't have hours and hours of stable time to sit in their house every day and practice scales. Yeah. So what did they do? They figured out the tools that would allow them a voice. And so there's a powerful desire and a powerful story. It just uses the tools that are available and, and, the, um, and the limitations in a lot of ways become the strengths. Exactly. So whether it's Callahan's scratch, scratchy art or whether it's Warhol doing screen prints because he's you know, doesn't want to be a fine arts painter, those become this this staple of what, what it is you're doing. Yeah. But the art itself gets through where that impulse gets through. Right. And I think, I, I know that I personally have, because I wasn't willing to just give over to that artistic side of myself, for some reason, somehow, in my childhood, I got the, I got the, I got the idea that art was not, worth anything it's not yeah. professional yeah you, you, you can create anything you want but you need to learn a trade you need right. to get a job you do know? that in your free time oh, yeah <laughs> you, you do that other stuff some other time you know and, right. and it and it was ingrained so deeply mm -hmm. that I've spent most of my adult life uh, trying to find my place in the world yeah, because right. that being an artist is my place. Yeah, I right should now. have been recognized as an artist as a child, sure. you know, because I was so off. Mm -hmm. I got horrible grades. I didn't get along with anybody. I had a horrible time with my parents. Mm -hmm. Somebody didn't figure out that there was something going on inside me, right? right? And so now in my adulthood, I'm like, okay, you know, and at 50 years old now, I can finally say, yeah, I'm an artist. Right. And I'm an artist because I've spent... 30 years or more uh, training myself to see the world some in a certain mm -hmm. way, you know? That's true. I mean, I, I, all of the stuff, I mean, I, I can literally say that everything that I do now is art mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because of the work that I've spent to learn how to be an artist, to see the world as an artist. And, uh, I don't know, that's huge for me. That's a huge understanding. I think that this video blog is has been a, uh, a real eye-opener for me, you know, mm -hmm. because I've been able to talk to a lot of different artists in a very short period of time, yeah. and I know that we all struggle with the same kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, I don't feel alone anymore, mm -hmm. and I feel completely inspired. <laughs> I, that's the biggest thing that I've gotten from this, is the inspiration from other artists, encouragement from other artists. Yeah. Well, just here, community. As, as, you know, as I said to you guys earlier, the way I met you guys was through just walking through the gallery over at Chris Haberman's place, the People's Gallery, and I just heard him talking and I thought, yeah, I, there was, I, want, I want to address two things. One, one was just something that he said that was, he said, I give a lot of stuff away. Right. Um, and it all that comes back to me. me. Too, yeah. yeah, and I, I was trying to get some other people to work on a graphic novel with me. I thought, I'll do my big graphic novel and then I'll do some small things like the Zap Comics, Underground Comics kind of things, just get some Portland artists. Mm -hmm. And when I talked to them, they were like, well, how much are you going to pay me? I'm like, I'm not an employer, guys. I am a broke artist like you. Mm -hmm. But if we do these things together, that brings more light on us. And people will see it the next time Dave Camp or Person B walks into this comic shop. They'll say, oh, yeah, I saw your thing. I thought it was really cool. So it's a way of combining, in a way of what you guys are saying, it, it's a way of combining forces when you, when you give away things or when you collaborate with people like what you guys are doing. Yeah. And then... What you're saying about taking a lot of years to learn how to be an artist, one of the, one of the secrets, uh, and kind of a dirty secret, in rock and roll in particular, is that a lot of the people you know about have parents that were jazz musicians, played in other bands, they were professional artists, someone like Beck 
his mom was one of the Warhol people, mm -hmm. and his uncle or grandfather is a big time, you know, uh, uh, painter or artist, and Lenny Kravitz. I mean, you, you go through a lot of these people and you say, they didn't come out the same way I did in a square background and exactly. try to be like, okay, I'm kind of square now, I'm going to have to figure this out year after year after year. They had a lot of um, informal teaching, just being around artists. Yeah. This is how you do it. This is what yeah. it looks like. Oh, you're free to do that. You can whatever. But it, it speaks to the same thing I was saying before about drawing or playing music is it does take time mm -hmm. to develop those things. And just because you start out not understanding it doesn't mean you can't. It just right. means you might have to take till you're 50. Yeah. Someone else comes out and they're 21 and they're like, yeah, I'm awesome and I've been to art school and I've been all over the world and my parents taught me this and they know how to talk the talk and walk the walk. But there's no deadline on it. And, you, and by communicating with other artists, you kind of learn how do we do this? Yeah. How, do you, how do you become this thing? And it is, I think it is a thing that you become. Yeah, I do too. And I'm not there yet. Yeah. I think we're all in progress. I think you become a thing and then you move on to the next thing and yep. then on to the next thing. Yeah. And, and you just want to get in the game. You, know, you just want to get good enough to but be the knowledge, right. yeah. knowledge of who you are, for me, has become paramount. Mm -hmm. Like, somehow I lost who I was somewhere mm -hmm. along the line. And now I've been really focusing on what are my idiosyncrasies, what are my weaknesses, what are my strengths, you know, who, who the fuck am I? What do I want out of my life, you know, I mean, uh, I'm still a little confused about all that, but we're wow. figuring it out. Yeah, you're in good that's the whole world. And the fun thing about it is if you write graphic, graphic novels about it, maybe other people will be like, hey, I see myself in this. Yeah. You know, you paint your paintings or you make your objects. That's what we're, that's your job. Yeah. And however much you get paid or don't get paid for it, that's don't your job. Paid. You just do it. Yep. You just do it. Yep. So that's decamparts.com. Yeah. Decamparts.com. Yep. And uh, you got anything, Jacob? Uh, oh, yeah, 4th F and Friday. Yeah, we, we talked to you just a little bit about 4th F and Friday. Uh, it's going to be January 23rd okay. at our home, uh, which is 119th and Powell. Okay. Uh, all of the artists that we've interviewed, we're inviting. Uh, we're asking all of the artists to donate a small piece of art for a, a raffle. Okay. Uh, and then uh, if a guest comes in and wants to give a free will donation of $5 or more, they can win art from Day Camp oh, cool. or Chris Haberman, yeah. or Christopher Hoisington, or myself. Yeah. All these other, or artists. Any other artists. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be tons of artists there. There's Great. at least 30. Cool. So, I love it. I love what you guys are doing. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anything, anything, there's, there's power in numbers. And so any kind of a predator wants to isolate its victim. And so you can see what that does. More people that know each other, more talking, the more collaborating, mm -hmm. the more comic books and painting shows and gigs and all that stuff. You just, it, it, it inspires and yeah, creates. It just grows. It does. It, grows. it does. So I appreciate what you guys are doing. No, thank, thank you yeah. for the last minute scheduling and oh, my pleasure. being so easy to work with. Uh, this has been a great interview. Like, oh, I'm glad. It's it really has. Full of gold. We're at really we're has. at 50 minutes. This is now okay. our longest longest video longest video. interview. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, like I said, that that made it for me just stretches and stretches. This could go for weeks. No, I love it. I, no, love, it's, I love you guys came by. Brilliant. Cool. Gold. Thank okay. you. All right. So uh, decamparts.com. Check, Check him out. Dave Camp. Yeah, and we'll, we'll be looking, writer, yeah, drawer. what was your band? Well, I'll tell you, my band is Stereo Vision, and we're going to do, we do the White Album Christmas every year with the Nowhere Band, and we did seven shows this year, they're all sold out, it was really fun. Wow. And the uh, Alberta Rose, we do it with the Wanderlust Circus, and we're going to do uh, the Who's Tommy in oh. May, at the end of May. Really? Yeah, 29th and 30th, as far as I know, at the Alberta Rose, oh. so... That's one of the things we've been doing for years and years, and that's all of the stories. But um, so my band Stereo Vision, and I have a thing called Whip of the Swan. Anyways, I, just uh, you can stop by the Decamp Arts website and see those things. But come down to the Alberta Rose on uh, 29th and 30th yeah. of May because you will see the Who's Tommy, and it will be uh, in all its glory. So yeah, we're friends on Facebook now, so you can send me an invite. Yeah. Young man. Yeah, and we'll, we'll share we'll, all that stuff. We'll on plan on being there. Okay, good. Yeah, it's going to be a blast. I, cool. I'm stoked. Yeah.
All right, thank you guys for tuning in. We love you. Love you. Follow us, share us, please like us, love us, etc. Yeah. All right, thanks. Bye.